Hello everyone, welcome to session 14 of LTEC 623. This week I want to talk about the home stretch of the semester, the last three weeks, week 14, 15, and 16. Obviously, this is the beginning of week 14, and that means your final video production project, project three, is going to be assigned. Now I'll be talking about that a little bit in a couple of minutes. I also want to remind you that our two optional synchronous conversations are scheduled for this Wednesday, the 21st. One of them is going to be from 11 to 12 noon in my Zoom room. The second one will be from 4 to 5 p.m. on the same day in my Zoom room. You're welcome to come to these. They're entirely voluntary. It won't hurt your grade if you don't come. Of course, I'd love to have lots of you come and just kind of hang out and talk about digital video design and what we've learned and experienced this semester. So feel free to check that out if you're interested. And as a reminder, Critical Reflection 13, which will be your last Critical Reflection, is due on Monday, April 26th. Next week, week 15, I will release our weekly materials. There won't be a whole lot new there, and there won't be any specific assignments to free you up so that you can work on Video Production Project 3. Now, week 16 of the semester, that's actually the final week. And so I will release a final video on Tuesday, May 4th. The last day of instruction is May 5th. And May 6th and 7th, the Thursday and Friday of that week, are actually study days. And then your video production project three is going to be due Monday, May 10th. And you can take the whole day to submit your project. And all you'll have to do is upload it to a Google folder, just like you've done in the past. So that's the lay of the land for the home stretch of the semester. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Now, let's talk a little bit about Video Production Project 3. The goal is to produce an original, high-quality educational video in the quote-unquote conversation production style. The purpose is to practice filming an interview or a conversation, and then practice editing that footage into a compelling, incomplete story. Now, these videos might be a little longer than the other ones, but still relatively short, so let's try to keep them under eight minutes. The topic is entirely up to you. The idea here is that the interviewee is the authority or expert, and your goal is to listen and to capture someone else's experience and perspective. So have some fun with that. I think that's kind of interesting. Regarding Video Production Project 3, there are methodological and technical considerations. So let's walk through a couple of these. First of all, you're going to need to determine who you're going to interview and why. You can interview more than one person or a group of people or just one person. It's really up to you. Importantly, I want you to draw on our learning outcomes concentric circle to think about what it is you're trying to accomplish with this interview. Now, once you have a broad sketch of these details, be sure to share with your interviewee or interviewees the list of topics that you're hoping to talk with them about and do that in advance so they're not caught off guard. After you determine who you're going to interview and why, it's important to prepare an interview protocol. Now, an interview protocol is just kind of an outline of your interview. It's going to list the, the key points that you want to explore, some of the provisional questions that you might add, and any probes and or transitions that you think you'll need to insert into the interview itself. It's important that your protocol include a brief introduction so that the interviewee understands what's going to happen and the interview procedure and, and what the expectations are. And typically that's not taped. You'll also want to be clear with your interviewee that, that you have consent to record. So make that explicit. And then what you'll want to do with your protocol is just draft your interview questions. And really think about what kind of concepts are you trying to evoke with each of your questions. And then importantly, I want to encourage you to test out your questions with a friend before you actually meet with your interviewee. Your friends can help you determine whether or not your questions are clear and whether or not they can be worded to be less jargony or less complicated and just a little bit more laid back. So that's definitely something you'll want to do. 
when it comes time to actually conduct the interview, it's really important to establish some rapport with your interviewee or interviewees. Clarify the roles, the procedure, your expectations for them. And typically, you'll want to initiate with just an easy question such as, can you tell me about yourself? And the idea there is just to get them talking and comfortable, kind of a warm-up question. When you're conducting an interview, and I know this isn't a class about conducting interviews, it's important that you don't interrupt your participants. You want them talking. So try to avoid finishing sentences for them or inserting words. Just let them do the talking. And you're going to want to maintain eye contact with your interviewee. They should see you actively listening the whole time. And then also, you want to use open-ended questions to probe. Now, an example of that is you never want to just flat out ask why, because that can be a little bit intimidating to the interviewee. So think of ways to ask why, but using softer language, such as, hmm, can you tell me a bit more about why you say that? That can be really helpful in getting the interviewees to elaborate and explain their thinking. So those are some of the methodological considerations related to a conversation style video. Now let's talk about some of the technical considerations. Now obviously you want to think a lot about location. What's going to be the backgrounds? Most of the time you don't want a busy background. Sometimes you'll also want a background that has some depth. So if you take a look here at the picture in the upper right hand corner, you can see there's lots of room behind the subject. It's out of focus, which is fine, but it establishes that the interviewee is in the foreground, but there's kind of some depth to the background. Obviously, lighting is super important. That's something we've emphasized all semester. The composition, you'll want to follow the rule of thirds and you'll want to establish the eye line. In other words, what direction is the interviewee looking at? And connected to that is determining whether or not the interviewer will be on camera. So let's take a look at some examples from classic interview shows such as 60 Minutes or Dateline. All of the images on the left have the interviewer on camera. And usually it's the back of the interviewer. So you're just seeing over the shoulder footage. There is some variation in terms of how much of the body of the interviewer is caught on camera. So you'll want to think about what works for you. All of the examples on the right have the interviewer off camera. And so take a look at the eye line. Where, what direction are the interviewees looking? And presumably they are either talking to the camera or they're talking to the interviewer. And in most of these examples, you could imagine the interviewer sitting off camera and nodding and listening as the interviewees speak. Obviously, when you're conducting an interview, audio is super important. You want to make sure that your microphone is near the subject, typically about 8 to 14 inches away, and you'll want to record at a reasonable level, typically between minus 18 and minus 12 decibels. Notice that's a little bit lower than normal, and the reason for that is because the interviewee may shift their position slightly, and so you'll want to have a little bit of headroom in case they get a little bit closer to the microphone. Microphone. Something we often don't think about is you'll want to capture some B-roll type shots of your interviewees. This is just footage of your interviewee nodding or giving different types of reactions. This B-roll footage of your interviewee can be helpful for editing in different types of transitions. Another common technique is to capture close-up footage of them gesturing with their hands or holding a particular object of interest that relates to the topic being discussed. So these are some of the technical considerations that you'll want to keep in mind going into your interview situation. What I want to do with the last few minutes here is switch gears to talk a little bit about what's known in terms of what works and what doesn't work with instructional video. And this is actually from a special issue in Computers and Human Behavior. This special issue actually came out in 2018 and basically the gist of it was they were arguing in 
instructional video is super important. It's getting used all the time, but most instructional videos are still created based on authors or designers' intuitions instead of relying on documented principles derived from scientific research. And so because of that, the authors of this special issue argued that there's an urgent need for more knowledge to build research-based principles for designing instructional videos and to understand why they work. And so they put together this special issue to kind of speak to that need. Rather than assigning you this whole special issue to read, what I'm going to do is simply walk through some of the interesting studies that are a part of this special issue. So one of the topics covered in this special issue is the concept of segmenting. And the research question here was, should video designers use segmenting in their videos? And what do they mean by segmenting? Well, breaking a continuous multimedia presentation into meaningful segments with the learner controlling when the system moves on to the next segment. And the rationale for that was it might allow learners to digest one segment of the lesson at a time before moving on to the next one. And it might be super helpful if the material is complex or fast paced or unfamiliar. So they set up an experiment and they had occupational therapy students, they had 68 of them, and they were divided into different groups. Non-interactive video, interactive video with learner-paced controls, and then segmented interactive video that was system-paced. In other words, the system automatically advanced the interactive video. So what did they find? Well, they found that learners learn the most using the segmented format for procedural learning. Basically, the system-paced interruptions were actually helpful. And they found that the users didn't really use the pause button that much when it was available. And their interpretation of this result was that novices may not have the knowledge or metacognitive skills to know when they should pause a video. And therefore, as instructional designers, we should put in system-paced interruptions or segments to help chunk the information appropriately. So that was segmenting. Another research topic they looked into was mixing camera viewpoints. And the question they asked was, is the first person viewpoint better than other viewpoints? And or do multiple viewpoints help people learn procedures from video? And their rationale was that different perspectives may engage learners in the learning experience and promote deeper processing. So they set up a, an experiment with 43 nursing students and they watched different videos of a complex surgical procedure from different points of view. And they found that viewing the mixed perspective enhanced students' ability to subsequently reproduce the surgical procedure. In other words, it was a mix not just the over-the-shoulder, not just the face-to-face, -face, but the mixed perspectives that was more helpful in supporting learning. Now, another research question that was asked is, does seeing the instructor matter? And the question these researchers posed was, does the mere presence of an instructor in a video alter attention and learning? And the rationale for asking that question is that instructors will attract learners' attention, but at the expense of attention to what is being explained and or demonstrated. And will this affect learning? The researchers set up an experiment with tracking eye movements as they observed a video. They found that the instructor presence may be distracting and does not actually improve learning outcomes. And they argued that we should only show the instructor if he or she is engaged in activities intended to direct students' cognitive processing. If the instructor's there but not directing students' cognitive processing, then they shouldn't be there. Another interesting question that's been researched is the idea of the model observer similarity. And this is based on the question, does the effectiveness of a modeling example differ as a function of the gender of the model and the observer? And the rationale is people might see themselves as learners and try harder to learn from an instructional video when they have rapport with the on-screen instructor. And this relates to the model observer similarity hypothesis, which predicts that learners who perceive themselves to be more similar to the model will learn more from the examples and show greater self-efficacy gains. 
So they had an experiment with secondary education students, quite a few of them actually, and they watched two video modeling examples, either by a male or a female. The example content in the video was kept equal. So what did they find? Well, they found that students perceived models of the same gender as more similar to them. That makes sense. However, matching for model gender did not significantly impact learning, self-efficacy, or the perceived competence of the model. In other words, this research suggests that gender may not greatly contribute to feelings of model observer similarity, and thus it may not be an important design consideration for video lessons. And the last one is this concept of inserting pauses. And this research asked, will inserting pauses into instructional videos enhance learning? And the rationale behind inserting pauses is that they may reduce the amount of information students have to process concurrently, and they may help structure the lesson by segmenting it into meaningful units. Think of it as analogous to paragraphs in text, where idea by idea is laid out. And so they conducted a, an experiment using adults watching a video about acoustic oscillations. And as you can see in the diagram, there were actually four different examples. The top bar was the video with no pauses. The second one included structural markers. In other words, a black screen for 150 milliseconds. The third condition included pauses at meaningful breakpoints, and those pauses lasted three seconds. Or the fourth one, which is pauses at alternative, non-meaningful breakpoints. And those pauses lasted three seconds. So what did they find? Well, they found that there was no significant differences among the conditions in terms of retention, transfer, or self-reported cognitive load. In other words, overall, three-second pauses did not seem to have a strong and consistent effect on learning outcomes. So those are some examples of empirical research and their findings related to research-based design principles that you may be wondering about related to instructional video. I wanted to share these with you to give you a taste of the kind of research that's happening in the area of instructional video. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.